Bibles to Judges chapter 2, and we'll get into lesson 53 in our Bible survey. I'm starting to truck, uh, truck along uh, as we, <laughs> uh, in our Bible survey, we're, we're hitting that point in Israel's history uh, when they now are worthy of that first course of punishment, and that's what they're falling under now here um, in the book of Judges. That's why Judges is in the Bible and um, I'm, I'm just going to read a passage here, verses, uh, Judges chapter 2, uh, verse 16 down through 23. Uh, that will give, give us a passage that we can review upon, and then we're going to move on into looking at a few of the judges, looking at, again, the, the, con, the context of, of everything, and then move on to the last section of the book of Judges, and, and then move on eventually, uh, probably next lesson, into 1 Samuel. So we're going to go ahead and read this passage, Judges chapter 2 and verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following, after, uh, in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it, or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, Neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening that we can redeem the time to your honor and glory. Father, it is a privilege, an absolute privilege and a, and a grave responsibility in the, in the most best way that you can use the word grave to be able to gather together with the saints and to be able to open up the most precious possession that we have uh, in this life, your word. And there's nothing that compares to it. And the, the study of your word, I think about all the, all the, the passages in, your, in this book that describe uh, your word. I believe it was uh, Job or Jeremiah, I forget which one it was, but, but how the word of the Lord and they ate it up. And just the, the study of your word and what it yields in our lives and how it effectually works to produce the very things that you uh, have it designed to produce. So we thank you for this time that we can open up the pages of your word. Even though we're in the, your time past dealings with the nation of Israel, we can gain a better frame of reference of what you're doing in time past, understand more of who you are, and understand uh, matters that are beneficial for us to understand even in our own edification and the dispensation of your grace in which we live as members of the church of the body of Christ. We thank you that we can study your word diligently that we can look at every word and every precept that makes up a concept, that makes up a thought, that, that makes up your mind and how you handle things, both in time past, but now, in the ages to come, and for all eternity. Those are the things in which we're being educated in so that we could uh, rule and reign with you, having your mind, the mind of Christ, uh, for not only in the life that now is, but in the life that, that is to come. So, Father, I pray that uh, for the saints that we would set aside the cares and concerns that we have in the world, for there are many, as we live not only in this present evil world, but in this crooked, perverse nation, as did the Philippians, as uh, Paul mentions that in Philippians, and that, we could, and that we would set those things aside, knowing that the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings of Christ, work for us. And that we can be a more than conqueror in them through the, the comforting doctrine and the grand hope that you give us in your word. And that we can relax and enjoy your word here this evening with saints that have a, have a mutual faith with one another. As we are members one of another, one body in Christ. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, again, we are in the book of Judges here. And... Uh, just by way of review, I'll just throw up my, uh, the, the outline here. We broke Judges down into three major sections. Judges chapter 1 to the end of chapter 2. 
And here you have the basic understanding of the seeds of rebelliousness sprouting. And we saw there in, in chapter 1, things start to go well with the generation that outlived Joshua. Uh, however, <clears throat> even though they went well for a while, what you start to see is that the nations, or Israel, as they go out to try to conquest more of the nations that are around about them, God, they, they start to be not able to drive them out. And we knew from passages beforehand, if they're not able to drive out the nations, that's because they're not hearkening to the voice of the Lord. That's because they're getting involved in the gods that these nations serve, and they start to go a-whoring after him. And that's involved in this passage as well. And that's what we started to see in Judges chapter 1. In Judges chapter 2, the angel of the Lord comes to them from Gilgal. We, last week, we looked at the significance of Gilgal. That was the place in which Israel encamped when they crossed the Jordan. It was a time of reflection, both of, of the victory that God won for them out of Egypt, the provision he made for them in the wilderness, the provision he made for them to get into the promised land that he promised their fathers, but also the, uh, the anticipation and the expectation of the victory that they're going to have over the nations within the land, uh, starting there in Jericho. And that's where Gilgal is, and the angel Lord comes from that place. And that was a, that's a significant place, again, not only for this generation, but for the uh, generations later to come, as we talked about Elijah, <clears throat> when Israel starts to find themselves uh, worthy of the third course of punishment, one of the things that Elijah does is he gets out of the land, he walks out of the land, and he goes to specific places, and those specific places are a connection with the places in which Israel came to when they entered into the land. And where he ends, as it were, is, is guilt, well, not where he ends, but before he goes outside the land, it's, a, it's signifying uh, God's present, presence leaving the land, but one of the places he goes before leaving the land is Gilgal. So this, that location is going to come up over in the scriptures. And that's what Israel should remember after every victory that they have, is they should remember Gilgal. The victory they had over Egypt and the, the anticipation of the victory to come. And after every victory, they should, they should be thankful for the victory that they just won and the next victory to, victory to come. And know that, that it took place based upon, well now it's going to be based upon their obedience, hearkening to the voice of the Lord and God therefore blessing them and having the victory for them. And that God, was, that God would do it for them. But... Israel gets caught up in, the, in these nations and their gods. They get involved in the idolatry. They have a, a, a vain repentance, as it were, there in chapter 2. And then the passage in which we just looked at, verse 16 down to the end, you get a uh, synopsis of how to deal with the book of Judges. And you can see that there in verse 18 again. It says, When the Lord raised up judges, then the Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies, that's Israel, all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their father, fathers, and following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And what you have is that downward roller coaster is that you would, you would have Israel in apostasy, the judge would be raised up, delivered from their enemies, things would go well for a while, go up, but then after the judge would die, the, um, the people would go back into apostasy, apostasy and, and be corrupted more than their fathers, and so they would just go down even more and even more. And that's what the curses are. The, the, the courses of punishment are just that. They're the, they're the issue of Israel corrupting themselves, kind of starting here, but really seeing who they are by nature, by receiving the curses, that really they're the, the dust on the feet, as it were. And that's what the law is going to teach them throughout their history, that, boy, you by nature are no different than the Gentiles of the nations around you. And that's what the Apostle Paul eventually teaches, is he is the the full revelation of things um, regarding how God views man in, in general. And he explains that every man, they came from Adam. And that's the root of the problem. Um, and so, again, that's, what's, that's what we're looking at. And that's what's going to take place with these judges. Therefore, again, you have a, a brief synopsis before you actually get into the main section of the book. Judges chapter 3 to the end of Judges chapter 16, when God, therefore, does raise up judges. And again, one of the things that you have to keep in mind 
is that Israel now has fallen under the first course of punishment. Look at that terminology here in verse 14 of Judges chapter 2. It says, and the anger of the Lord, and you can just dock that expression in the back of your mind. Because every time that expression is used, from now on, and even beforehand, but you, Israel is going to be under a course of punishment or are going to find themselves under a subsequent course of punishment, the second, third, fourth, fifth. And it's interesting because for a long time that expression isn't used in Israel's history. After the first course runs its course, and Israel is, finds themselves in a position worthy, uh, worthy of the second course, God, based upon the reserve clause of Exodus 33, reverses the first and gives, him, gives them the blessing, gives them the kingdom with David and Solomon. And, and you don't have that expression used. But then you'll start to see it when Israel starts to want a... Uh, uh, um, af afterwards with, with Solomon there, and Solomon goes and brings the nation back into his, uh, an apostasy, you start to see that expression being used again, the anger of the Lord. And here comes the second course of punishment. And so it's an, it's an expression that gives you kind of a marker, a checkpoint of, of some things that are going on in Israel's history. But again, notice as he goes on there, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of who? Spoilers. And again, and we've, we've talked about it a lot, but let's just review it. Uh, that's in direct reference to Leviticus 26. Come, come there with me. Leviticus 26, and look at verse 14, where he starts to give the details of the curses of the law contract based upon their disobedience, and they're outlined again in those courses as we did that uh, work and that study uh, lessons ago. Verse 14, but if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judge, judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. One of those commandments, again, is to not have a graven image and not worship other gods. And that's what they're going to be, they're, what they're getting involved in here uh, in the book of Judges. Look what he will do to them. Verse 16. I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning agu that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Now notice this after the colon here. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. So they're going to sow, but they're not going to be able to reap what they sow. Their enemies are going to reap what they sow. And they're going to spoil their See, they're going to spoil what they have as far as their agriculture. Verse 17, And I will set my face against you, and ye, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. So that's what Israel is now starting to fall under. Again, Judges chapter 2 and verse 14. That's what, what the, uh, what's being brought up here in the book of Judges, the hands of the spoilers that spoil them. And notice that, he, the Lord, delivered them into the hand of the spoilers. That's stipulated by the law of contract. God's keeping his part. The beauty of all this is you have those, the, the God holding up to his part of the, the law contract and the stipulations, at the same time operating upon that reserve clause of Exodus 33. Because nowhere in the law does it say, when you fall into the first course of punishment, I'm going to give you judges. judges the, the judges that God raises up in the midst of the first course of punishment are based upon his Jehovahness and his grace. There is grace in the Old Testament. It's not the dispensation of grace, but there is grace. And that's what he's operating upon. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve judges. Not one bit. But yet he gives them to them. He raises them up to deliver them for their enemies for a time. So again, you got to keep that in mind. Judges, you're in the first course of punishment. That timeline, that prophetic timeline of those curses and courses of punishment begin here in the book of Judges. And two, know what's going to go on with the judges. They're going to be raised up. Deliverance is going to take place. 
But once he dies, Israel is going to corrupt themselves more than their fathers. The third thing you want to keep in mind is that what we, what we read at the end of our passage here in verse 21 of Judges chapter 2, he says, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Verse 22, that through them, through the enemies, through the nations, I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. That word prove again, and I'm a broken record, is, an, is, a, is a term that describes a testing, a trying, an education. I, use, I always use the example of a teacher. You learn some information, and then the teacher's going to come along and prove how much information you know by testing you. And that's why the Apostle Paul can come along in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 4, talk about the law as a schoolmaster and a tutoring governor. And he can talk about in Romans chapter 3, but we know, uh, by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's, it's a knowledge, it's an education, it's an educational system, one, of, uh, one that deals with children, one that is a, is a tutor and governor, it's a schoolmaster, and Israel's under it, and that's what he's doing. He's going to prove them. And after, when he raises up each one of these judges, it's like he's coming along and saying, did you learn your lesson? Did you see what just took place? You were in bondage, these spoilers came in and took of you. I raised, I raised up a judge, delivered you, and had deliverance for however many years. He died, and you go off. I raised him. Did you learn your lesson? Did you? And, and that's, what he, that's what he's doing. And that's what he's doing all throughout the law contract. It's a schooling of Israel of the lesson they should have learned again when they're in Egypt and where, when they were in Exodus 15, Exodus 19 there, the wilderness of, of Shur to Mount Sinai, when he was doing the very thing that he's doing under the law, proving them whether he's going to keep their law, his law or not. And again, that's all to teach them that they're sinners by nature. They're no different in and of themselves. God has made them different. So again, as we move into this next section now, just keep those things in mind. And so we're going to deal with the judges that raised up, in the, the time that we have remaining, if we get to it, we'll, we'll move into the third section, Judges 17, to the end of the book, and we'll look at the depth of corruption working in Israel and them not responding to the first course of punishment. Um, let me throw up the list of judges here real quick. I think I got them all here. Um, I don't know if you can read that or not, but you have, you have Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah and Barak work together, Gideon, uh, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ib Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, and Samson. The ones that I have highlighted, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, are given, other ones are given a good portion within uh, Judges 3 to the <clears throat> end of six, chapter 16, <clears throat> but those three are given the most amount of space within that section. And usually when God, well, usually when God gives a good amount of a portion of scripture to something, <clears throat> that means it's very important. <laughs> uh, that's not a hard rule because if he says something once, it's also very important. But how much more when he gives it a, a good uh, a, a portion or space in your Bible? And so when you're dealing with the first course of punishment in, in Judges, and you start to see, I think um, Gideon is given about two chapters uh, as well as Samson uh, about that. And so there's some significant things that God is trying to teach Israel within, the, within all the judges, but if you can narrow it down, Gideon and Samson. Jephthah, there, there's some wonderful things there in Jephthah. In fact, turn with me to Hebrews before we get into looking at Gideon and Samson. Hebrews chapter 11. These guys... I love when God does this. I love when God brings something up <clears throat> that's going to be taking place out here and he brings something up that took place way back here <laughs> because it shows you the significance of what's going on back here. And as we have all the scripture, we can come out we can come here, look at the doctrine, look at what's, being, uh, what's, what's going on, but also grab things from here and say, that's what God was doing. 
And really, that's what, that's what some, came, uh, some that were living at the time understood, but the majority didn't come to understand. But uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, you have the, the wall of faith and all these things. Hebrew, Hebrews 11 isn't a passage of, of justification unto eternal life. By, Noah had faith, and therefore he was justified, and Abraham had faith, and he was just... It, this, Hebrews 11 is not dealing with justification. It's dealing with reward. It's by faith they not only had faith, but by faith they did some things, and the things that they were involved in, in obeying God and what he, ex, he said, they, would, they got certain rewards. And that's significant for the Hebrews out here at this time because one of the things that's going to be doled out when the Lord returns is reward. And, and different ranks and positions and, and jobs and, and uh, just other various rewards that are going to take place in that, in that kingdom. That's part of the, the Sermon on the Mount, too. He's describing, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, and they will, do th- they will get this. And they will th- All those things there are in regards to those that would believe and are ju- by justified by faith alone, they get reward and blessing in that kingdom based upon their life that, that took place before that kingdom. And so Hebrews 11 is all about reward. In fact, look at this real quick. In Hebrews 11, uh, look at verse... We're just jumping in here, but look at verse 35. He says, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured. Notice this, not accepting deliverance. They could have got deliverance, but they said, no, we don't want the deliverance. Why? Here's the purpose. That they might obtain resurrection. Is that what it says? A better resurrection. That same principle lies within the dispensation of grace as well. Which is just phenomenal. That not only does he give you resurrect, not only will he resurrect you unto eternal life, but you can have a better resurrection of the glory that's involved in that. Notice, he, uh, well, we'll just, we'll just leave it at that for now. Um, and so that's the context of what's being dealt with here in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, come down with me, or come back with me to uh, verse 31. It says, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believe not, when she hath received the spies with peace. And what shall, I, what shall I more say? For the time shall fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. There you have Samson and the mouth of the lions, Daniel and all those. Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of of aliens. And so you, you have some wonderful things that are being described here that Israel are supposed, Israel is supposed to see and learn from. That's, where, that's why chapter 12 is going to come into play. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses he just set forth in chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And that's going back under the law. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That, see, that they're going to have to endure some things out here during that time of tribulation. And they need to look to Jesus, their author and finisher of the faith, and, and, and learn from all the cloud of witnesses that he just set forth in chapter 11. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You could die for these things, as he explained to him. But take note of what he just said in regards to some didn't accept deliverance and they obtained a better resurrection. Keep that on your mind. And so when he brings those guys up there in verse 32, Gideon, Barak, and Samson, Jephthah, there's some significance of what was going on back there. And so that's another reason, if you need reason, 
to, to study those guys out. Now we're going to look at two again. We're going to look at Gideon and Samson for a very, for a very specific reason. Uh, let's turn there. Uh, we're not going to read everything that they're involved in, but come with me to Judges chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 6 and verse 11. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6 and verse 11 is the first time that Gideon is mentioned. And he's not going to be done being dealt with until the end of chapter 8 and verse, verse 35 there. I want you to notice something in regards to Gideon. Now, there are times within the book of Judges that God uses the term delivered. And not just that he delivered Israel into the hands of the enemies, but that he delivered Israel from the enemies. But one of the most time, times that's used, or as, as it's used the most often with Gideon, the issue of deliverance. And when you have that word lined up and, and along with the portion that, of scripture that's given to Gideon, that should alert you to some things. At least it does me. Maybe I'm crazy. So you just got to take, take for what it's worth. But this is, these, are, these are the things that I've come to understand, which I think are, again, are just phenomenal. Look at, look at when Gideon's brought up here, chapter 6 and verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, and pert that pertained unto Joash, the Ab Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon's hiding here, again, because they're on the first course of punishment, and the spoilers are going to come in. There, he's, he's doing some things regarding the, the winepress. He threshed the wheat by the winepress, but he's hiding what their, their, their product, as it were, from the, the, the Midianites. And... But God's going to utilize this guy, Gideon. Look what he goes on to say in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? See, Gideon didn't understand something. Even though God's going to utilize Gideon, Gideon didn't understand why these things have befallen them. It's interesting. Compare this to Daniel. Come with me to Daniel. Hold your hand there. And get Daniel chapter 9. Now Daniel's way down in Israel's history. But it's interesting how the law and the courses of punishment are going to educate Israel through their generations. Will educate at least a remnant. Look at Daniel 9. Now Daniel, again, <clears throat> if you have your timeline there, let me see if I got a bigger one, a little bit bigger, not too much. Daniel's, where is, where is he? I can't see. Right here. He's under the fifth course of punishment. So we're right here. We're in Judges. Daniel's all the way over here, just to give you a frame of reference, okay? But look at what he says. They're, they, they're under Babylonian captivity. They're, they started the fifth course of punishment. That was the marker of the fifth course of punishment. They would go into captivity of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles politically would, would begin. And look what he says here. Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. In the first day of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood. That's different than Gideon. Gideon doesn't understand. Why has all this befallen us? Why are the Midianites on our backs, as it were? And why am I hiding from the Midianites? And why are they taken from us if you're with us? Look at what Daniel. I, Daniel, understood by books. They got books now. <laughs> that's, that's what you have before, Daniel. Books. I understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. So he's also got Jeremiah as contemporary. That he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of, desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel, in his time, under the fifth course of punishment, understands by books 
and by Jeremiah how much time, why these things are befalling them, and not only that, but how much time he's going to be under the Babylonian captivity, 70 years. You know why? Well, keep reading here. Verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made my confession. Hold your hand here. I know I'm probably got, don't have enough fingers, but hold your hand here and come with me to Leviticus 26 again. Leviticus 26. And again, after you get the details of the fifth course of punishment, look at what he's educating them in and proving them in and what they, how they ought to respond and therefore and respond by the education. Leviticus 26 and verse, uh, start here in verse 39. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in, in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall what? That's what Leviticus talked. He, he says, the generation ahead, if they confess, after all these things take place. And Daniel starts to experience. He doesn't experience the, to, the totality of the fifth, fifth course of punishment. He, where you are in Daniel 9, he just experienced the first installment. That's why the angel Gabriel is going to come and tell him, here's the remain, remainder of the timeline. You have the, the second, third, fourth, and fifth installment still left. And how much time that is? 490 years. But he's experienced some of the fifth course of punishment, and he understands by, he, by books, by Leviticus 26, I made my confession. Look, look at this. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers. Look what he's going to say here. Turn back to Daniel. Hold your, hold your hand there, too. Daniel chapter 9, verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. Keeping the covenant. The covenant is the law. And what they're under right now. And to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. There's his iniquity. And have committed. There's the word. Iniquity. And have, have done wickedly. And have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts. And from thy judgments. Remember what Leviticus 26 and verse 14 said. If ye shall despise my statutes. And if your soul shall abhor my judgments. That's what Daniel's confessing. Verse 6. Neither, shall we, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in the name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. He got schooled by that law. And also by the, the books of the law. But unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries where thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings and to our princes and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Look, look at verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. He's, he's looking at, I'm telling you, he's got Leviticus 26 right there. He's learned it. He understood it. I just draw that up in comparison to Gideon. Turn back there. You can read that phenomenal passage and, and what he's going to do. We'll eventually deal with it in, in great detail, actually, once we get there. Um, you, I, I think you like Leviticus 26 now. At least we'll be done with it for, for, for right now. But again, when, he, when Gideon says this, again, it's because he doesn't understand what that law is doing. Look at verse 13 again of Judges chapter 6. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And notice what else he's going to say. And where be all his miracles with our, uh, which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Those miracles, remember in... Uh, 
I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 32. Turn there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm sorry, not Deuteronomy, Exodus 32. Now I'm not going to be able to find it. It's on the right page, in the right column. Anyways, I'm sorry. I just was going to throw that out just to remind you. But back there in Exodus, you can, you can just forget about that. But back there in Exodus, he covenanted with Israel to do wonders in their midst. So that they would see the work of the Lord. He gave them a covenant. That's why, that's why God doesn't have to do those things in the dispensation of grace. He didn't covenant with you to do that. And when he did covenant with Israel, he did that based upon their performance. That's how most Christians evaluate their life. If God's given me a miracle, I must be doing well. If I'm getting a curse, something bad happened, things must be going bad. That's all law. You get that out. That's not how God's dealing with you. That's, ch- that's child. You, wanna deal, you want God to deal with you as a child, go put yourself in the law. But you want to be in adulthood. That's what we're going after, okay? But, what, but right now, because of their lack of performance, because of that, that law contract, they're not seeing the work of the Lord in their midst. And so Gideon's coming along and saying, why is all these things taking place? And he doesn't understand. I'm just bringing this out to show you that, that they're under the first course of punishment, even though Gideon, whom God's going to utilize, doesn't quite understand that. Now, uh, I'm going to speed these things, speed this up a little bit. Look at Judges chapter 7, and we're just going to grab this word out. You can study this more in detail um, for yourself, but look at Judges chapter 7, verse 9. You're still dealing with Gideon here. Again, God's going to raise up Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Look at verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have what? delivered it into thine hand. Look at verse 14. And this fellow answered and said, This is nothing else, uh, nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God, what? Delivered Midian in all the hosts. Look at verse 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath what? Delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Look at chapter 8 and verse 3. God hath delivered into your hand the princes of Midian and Oreb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward them when he had said that. Again, God had, hath delivered. Look at verse 7. And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmanah into, uh, into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with, with briars. Again, the issue of delivered. The last one here. Look at verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. What do you think is God's, one of the things, God's trying to teach you with Gideon. His ability to what? Deliver. Deliver. No pun intended. He's able to deliver. That's one of the main things with all the judges, but when, when, when you focus on one, Gideon, he's trying to teach Israel. Gideon didn't deliver him. I mean, he did, but God helped him to deliver uh, Israel out of the Midianites' hand. God did that. And that's who Gideon is based upon the rever- reserve clause, part of God's Jehovahness and grace to Israel in the midst of their disobedience. <laughs> Deliverance. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. Now let's look at an, uh, the, uh, a Samson. Come with me to Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15, the first time Samson's mentioned... Well, he's, he's mentioned before this. I have when... Uh, he's mentioned back there in verse 14. 
but what I want you to see is, is the, the terminology that, that's being used with Samson. It's not just del deliverance, but something else. Now, it's used one other time with Deborah and Barak, the issue of avenging. But it's used with Samson here uh, two times. And I know two's not a lot, but when you look at, it's only mentioned three times in the book of Judges. When you have two times mentioned as Samson, well, two-thirds, that's the majority. And, uh, but that's what one, of the, uh, one of the other things that God is teaching. Through Samson, Samson's given the most portion of, 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 of space here in, in Judges. And look what he says here. Look at Judges chapter, uh, where am I? 15 verse 7 here. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be, what? Avenged of you. And after that I will cease. Look at chapter 16 in verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, we can't get into much detail, but one of the, there's two major things. Oh, I have a slide for this, so we'll just keep it to that. There's two major things in the book of Judges that God's, in the, in the doctrine of Judges, is trying to teach Israel. And that is one, he has to deliver Israel from their enemies. He's got to deliver them. And not only that, but he also needs to avenge his cause with them. And we'll deal with that uh, avenging issue more as we go along. There's five major issues in the first course of punishment that come out. I want to just bring this home before I forget to do it. After Judges, you're going to have Ruth. And one of the major things, and we'll briefly look at Ruth, is you're given the, the not just the laws of redemption, because you're given that in, in Leviticus, in the, book of the, in the book of the law, but with Ruth, you're, you're given the, the qualifications of a redeemer and what's involved in, in redemption. I mean, that's, that's what Ruth is about. It's all that Ruth is about. Ruth being redeemed. Ruth and Naomi. So one of the things you're taught in this, in this portion of scripture that consists of the, of the first course of punishment, Judges, the first Samuel 15, you have these five major issues. Ruth, it's redemption. Gideon, is, you're dealing with deliverance. Samson, avengement. We'll eventually get to it. But one of the, 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 one of the things we're about to look at eventually is Israel, the depth of Israel's apostasy hits its main point under the first course of punishment when they ask for a king like the other nations. And there's a lot more going on there than just meets the eye. We'll eventually deal with that, but that's the thing. And so they need a, they need a king, and God is their king. And that's what, that's what Samuel comes along and says, uh, and, and God comes along and tells Samuel, don't they not know that I'm their king? I rule and reign over them. But they want, and what, really what they're, folks, really what they're saying there, when God's ruling and reigning over them, and they say, we want a king just like the other Gentiles, they're saying, we want the adversary to rule and reign over us. And that brings them to their worthiness of that second course of punishment. And so they need a king. But not only that, but what, what are they under the first course of punishment? They're under the curses. They need the blessing. And God's got to do all that for them. Now, I just want to bring this up in connection with something that was, we, we briefly brought up when we were back there in Genesis. Come back to Genesis, I think it was, I think it's 12. Genesis 12. Well, it's not Genesis 12, it's 15, Genesis 15. This might be a stretch for you, but God never does things haphazardly, nor by coincidence. 
And I don't think this is, this is by coincidence. When you, there's many issues that are dealt with in this portion of Scripture. Judges through 1 Samuel 15, end of 15. But these are five major issues, okay? So I'm not saying these are the only things that God brings out in that portion, but they're the five major issues. Remember back when Abraham asked the question to God, whereby shall I know that I, I shall inherit the, the land? Back there in Genesis 15, verse 8. Look at what takes place after that. Look at verse 9, Genesis 15, verse 9. And he said to them, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. How many animals you got there? Five. Five. And remember what he does. The first three he divides. And, 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 and what's going to take place is you have this, this lane, as it were, and there's going to be horror and thick darkness and, and all these things. But there's going to be a, a lane, as it were, that, that goes by, and, and Abraham doesn't go through it. God goes through it. And he goes through these animals. The first three are divided. And I love the last two because you have the, the turtle dove and, and pigeon. And the issue of, of, of peace and, and rest and, and glory, as it were, those, those animals represent. But, and those ones aren't divided. And there's, there's a lot that goes here. But notice that there's, there's five. And the first three, they're divided. And there's going to be, a, there's gonna be blood. When he divides them, he... he Splits them in half and there's blood. So there's going to be bloodshed, but also he's got to, there's got to be three things, five things, sorry, that need to take place that God has to do. He's walking through it in order for Abraham and his seed to inherit the land. And my understanding, that's the same five issues now in more detail, progressive revelation. And what's going to come along after the first course of punishment is David, when they start to get a, a, a king, but opposite of Saul, a king who, who has a heart after God's own heart. And God, again, he reverses the first course of punishment. He gives them great blessing. He gives them a taste of their kingdom. It's an interlude of blessing based upon the Exodus 33 reserve clause. Great prosperity, great agricultural success, all the Gentiles come unto, uh, unto the Israel. It's, it's again what the, the remnant, the, the disciples refer to here in Acts chapter 1. Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're referring back to that time with David. And with David, God is going to give the Davidic covenant. And there's, guess how many issues, major issues in that Davidic covenant? Five. Oftentimes, 2 Samuel 7 is the only passage in, that, that is really focused on regarding the Davidic covenant. That just gets the ball rolling. That just comes along and says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and these are some of the details. The major details of that Davidic covenant is the book of Psalms. And guess how many volumes the book of Psalms is broken up into? Five. Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. 24, isn't that the, the issue of of, of um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me in connection with redemption? We'll eventually deal with it and we'll see, the, the, we'll, see the, we'll break down the volumes of the book of, of, the book of Psalms and we'll see which, within each of that volume there's like three major core Psalms to that that teach each one of these issues to Israel. All, all prophetic regarding this time. Well, the second, first, and advent, the first and second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God's got to do it for them. And therefore, what he's going to do is he's going to give them redemption. He's going to provide redemption. And then when he returns, he's going to give them deliverance. He's going to avenge. He's going to be their king and their blesser. If you think that's neat, which I do, come with me to Isaiah chapter 9. When you start to look at some of these things and you think, nah, that can't be. I mean, that's just almost too good. And I can't make that up. I just, I'm not that, I'm really not that smart. I, I learned all this. So I can't, I didn't come at, see it myself, nor can I just come up with it. 
But look at Isaiah chapter 9. This is a wonderful passage in regards to Israel out here in the kingdom looking back to what God did for them so that they could be in the kingdom and they ascribe God a name. And guess how many parts to this name there is? Five. Verse six, we're just jumping in. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful, redemption, counselor, that's the avengement issue. The mighty God, deliverance. The everlasting father, that's the issue of blessing. And the prince of peace, that's the issue of him being the king. And it's what they look as, as it, that it's, again, it's a, the passage of the, the government, the increase of his government will be upon his shoulder. That's what's taking place in the kingdom. And they're now looking at how they got there, and they're looking at, their God sitting on that throne, David's throne, that's why Isaiah's mentioning here, the son, that's the son of David who's been given. And he's wonderful. He's a counselor. He's the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's our redeemer, our deliverer, our avenger, our king, and our blesser. And that's what the Davidic covenant comes along and says. I'm, I have to be, and that's, the, remember those seven Jehovah compound names? that we went through as well, those can be broken up in five. There's two sets of two in there that, that make, up, make up five. You have Jehovah, uh, Jireh, and Rafeka fit into the issue of redemption. And, and Nisi, I believe, is their deliverance, and, 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 and the other ones fit into there. And so again, it's those five main things that need to take place for Israel. God has to do for Israel for that, because they can't do it for themselves in order to inherit that land, not just inherit it under Joshua, inherit it under the true Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to do it for them. And God says of David's seed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make of you a house. I'm not going to make you a house. He's gonna, he does that too. He's already got the house built, the temple, the kingdom up in, up in heaven. But I'll make of you a house. I'm going to come in your flesh. I'm going to come and be a man. And I'm going to do these things for you. It's absolutely phenomenal. We're, we're, we're getting there. But in regards to Gideon and Samson, two of those major issues come out. The issue of deliverance and avengement. We'll, we're going to end. We're going to stop there. We'll pick up next lesson, Judges 17. I think it's just a great, good time to cut off. Um, but look at, I think I did this already one time, but I'll do it again just because we've got a, a, a bigger group here this time. I want you to see Paul bring this up, even. Look at Romans chapter 11. Folks, when you start to understand these things, if you think Paul's epistles couldn't open up any more to you because you understand right division and you understand the sense and sequence of, God, the, of godly edification, that there's Romans through Philemon and then there's certain things that God's going to accomplish, foundation, superstructure, capstone, when you add to that whole mix a frame of reference of the Old Testament and Paul who knew that probably better than, besides his teacher Gamaliel, better than anyone, bring that in and, and teach it to you properly, oh, it's absolutely wonderful. And, and, and that's why, again, even though, yes, Paul is inspired and God's inspiring Paul, but he's God can also utilize what Paul knows. And so it's not that just, oh, the, the Spirit's bringing me to this passage over here, and I'm going to write it down. Well, he, knows what this, he knows what this passage is designed, intend, and now he, now he has good understanding. He's a, he's a believer. He knows where he fits in God's program. Not in Israel's program, but in, in the body of Christ. He knows he's the apostle of the Gentiles. He knows that this passage is applied, but he knows when to bring it in when he's talking about his material. Like this passage. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. That's what's taking place. Blindness in part. God hasn't completely left off dealing with Israel. Again, the way in which God was going to deal with Gentiles in time past and, and, and what, how he's going to deal with them out in the future, what he promised 
was that a, a, a root of Jesse was going to rise and uh, uh, to rule over the Gentiles. He was going to rise to rule over the Gentiles. The way in which the Gentiles get salvation now is not through Israel's rise, but through their fall. And that's the mystery that Paul is talking about. He says, you don't, you don't be ignorant, because if you're ignorant, you can say whatever you want. You can have any theology you want. You can have any scholarship that you want, any initials on the end of your name. This is, this is fitting of you. And I read this verse, and I shrieked in horror. Because I never, I never want that to be true of me. And that's the issue of, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. You're just making things up. And you're wise in it. It's not that you look foolish or dumb in any of these things. You're wise in it. But they're your own conceits. Man, I don't want to be at the judgment seat of Christ and before the Lord and come along and say everything that I said I just made up in my own head. And I was wise in it. We have to rightly divide the scriptures and understand sense and sequence and, 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 and other things that go into the diligent study of God's word. His power is right here in this book today. Not in our external circumstances. Right here. You want life? Read the book. Get in the book. It's just amazing. Turn off the TV. Not legalism, but knowing where the excellency of his power is. Knowing that you can be conformed to the image of Christ by you studying the word of God, coming to understand it, believe it, and look for opportunities to apply it in your life. That's the way, that, it's simple. In one sense, it's simple how you get conformed to the image of Christ. Well, I'm getting off on a tangent there, but lest you should be wise, you can see it concedes that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. But look at what he's going to go on to say. Now he, he, he goes from this, he's going to move to this, okay? But look at how he does this. Remember one of those things we said, Redeemer, but then out here, Deliverer and Avenger? Watch. He says, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. That, that, not all Israel is of Israel, Romans chapter 9. But nevertheless, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the who? Oh. And he's quoting the Old Testament there. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's one of the things that goes into delivering and avengement. It's not just delivering from their enemies. That's just part A. Now that you deliver from their enemies, they've been in their enemies' thinking and bondage God's got to avenge his cause and he's got to teach, him, teach them his ways. He's got to give them the, the, the word to, the, to teach them, to educate them about who he is, the fullness of who he is and what he's doing. But that's what he's going to do. And we looked at those passages. This, it, it's interesting. You go back and, and the pastor says he's going to come to Zion. This one says come out of Zion. This is, this is the heavenly Zion that's up there in the, hev in the heavens right now, that's going to come down with him. He's going to come out and to the earthly Zion, but as a deliverer, to deliver his end. So, again, Paul's picking up one of those mandates of the Davidic covenant, the, the issue of deliverer there. And again, however much you want out of God's word is going to be based upon your study. It's going to be based upon how much time you put into it. Now, you can go down and read through that and just look at, wow, that's wonderful. God's going to deliver them. But to see the things connect, oh, it's just wonderful to have those things. And to have a frame of reference and see the connecting. Because when you have that, you're starting to see, you're starting to see your father. You're starting to see God. That he didn't just haphazardly start, oh, just I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. No, he's ordered, he's structured, he's got purpose and intent and reasoning and discernment and prudence. And he's exercising all those things. He's got a perfect balance of it and his justice and his judgment and his equity and his, his love and the law and all these things are coming into play and you get to see how they all work. That's what we ought to want. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. You get into your word and see the different connections and see your time past dealings with the nation of Israel to see the first course of punishment 
that Israel's under, the judges, the two main issues that are being described there as with Gideon and Samson, deliverance and avengement, and how you need to do that for Israel, and you're going to do that in perfect fulfillment, fulfilling the Davidic covenant, which we haven't even got to yet, but as we looked at just briefly, to, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver Israel, to avenge them, and avenge your cause with them, and be their king and their blesser, all based upon you redeem them. Those five major issues, as we saw, are not only back there in the Old Testament, Paul brings them up. Romans chapter 1, the gospel of God, which concerned his, his son, which was the seed of David. All those issues Paul's picking up on in perfect accord with the dispensation of the grace of God in which we live. And we thank you that we can come to understand these things and, and see the, the name in which you're going to have out there when everything's fulfilled. And Israel looks back. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. That's a, that's a name in which you'll hold because of the five major things you did for Israel that you had to do for them. That they're learning back as we're back there in Judges. We thank you for your word, Father. And as true of anyone else, it's true of me. Of There's so many cares, concerns in this world. It's easy to be victimized by the course of the world and the things that can drown out the excellence of your power in your word today. But may we constantly and persistently fight against those things. Not because some of those things, not because they're bad in and of themselves, but because your word is more excellent. It's that much better. And may we have a zeal for the study of your word to diligently seek you and have faith in what your words say. And that we lift our voice for understanding, knowing that as we study more and more, we will get the answer. Not because we're special, because that's the way you designed it. That's what brings glory to you. So we thank you we can learn all these things and much more as we go out throughout our, throughout our week. And that we can come and gather together again on Sundays, open up the foundation of our education in the book of Romans, and learn about our new identity in Christ, and learn that that thing does not work under the law as well. So, Father, we th give you all the honor and praise through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone's listening or here that hasn't trusted the gospel of Christ, the gospel of your grace, that how that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again, they need to understand that your wrath is against them because of their ungodliness and because of their unrighteousness, and there's no escape in and of themselves. But you provided the escape through the redemption that's in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on that cross. And if they believe that Christ died for the, to pay the complete debt and penalty of their sin, this very moment, God will justify them. Meaning he'll forgive all their iniquity, past, present, future, their sin, past, present, and future, impute his righteousness unto them, and they'll possess the gift of eternal life. What a, most, what a precious, precious thing. May they believe this very moment. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving as the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 describes that it's a grace also to be involved in the giving to the assembly, to maintain the preaching of your word, and that not only takes place, the, the godly edification takes place here in these walls, but also outside of these walls. And also give the capacity to distribute to the necessity of the saints. We thank you for these things in which we can labor in. And may we be honest, genuine, and, and good stewards of these things, knowing that the power to do those things and the wisdom to do those things come not from us, not our own conceits, but from your word. We thank you for all these things. In Christ's name we pray, amen.